All right, guys, welcome to the show. Uh, today, I am jam-packed, so I'm going to discuss in a second the new Twitter leaks. It's part four. Um, this is the specifics of the Donald Trump removal, so you get to see the debates and whatnot that were happening behind the scenes. I also have uh, the MAGA voters were tricked into going full socialist. This is a really interesting video, and I have mixed feelings about it. And then uh, Bernie Sanders takes on Kirsten Cinema, probably the most aggressive comments I've seen yet from Bernie Sanders uh, on this issue, or honestly on any of the corporate Democrats. We have um, a beloved U.S. soccer reporter who was who's dead now. He died while covering a game in Qatar. But the backstory is super suspicious, super questionable. So I'm going to give you all the specifics and the ins and the outs of that story. Um, and then later on in the show, Hassan Piker was deplatformed, and uh, I got some very high-profile right-wingers who claim to love free speech, who were flat-out celebrating it. And we have uh, Andrew Yang needed a, a little bit of a reality check. And so I tried my best to provide that to him. So all this is coming today. Let's go ahead and jump into it. So... Uh, Elon Musk teamed up with Matt Taibbi, Barry Weiss, and this guy Michael Schellenberger to release what's called the Twitter files. And um, basically, we're, we're learning specifics about what went on behind the scenes and how Twitter censors, deplatforms, shadow bans, things of that nature. Now, uh, this guy Michael Schellenberger, I believe he ran for office in California. He's got that same origin story that we've seen a hundred times over of like, well, I used to be a good lefty and liberal, and now, um, you know, reality has mugged me, and so I've turned conservative in many ways. So this is this guy's origin story. The original Twitter files, again, we covered this. Go check out the long segment that we did on this if you want more specifics on it. But what we learned from um, the original dump of information is the Trump... White House, along with the Biden campaign, were reaching out to Twitter to get certain things removed. Now, they didn't give us any specifics on the Trump White House, which is kind of annoying because I'd like to know exactly what the White House was, you know, calling for to be removed. That seems important. And that seems like it has First Amendment implications, like direct implications around the legality of the First Amendment, not just the spirit of it. But the Biden campaign, uh, they did not reach out about the Hunter Biden laptop story. In fact, it was just... Um, Vijaya Gotti, uh, one of Twitter's top officials, one of the top executives, who basically made that move on her own and argued for it behind the scenes. Um, and the other thing we learned is that what the Biden campaign did try to get removed from Twitter was literally just Hunter Biden revenge porn. It was like dick pics that were posted, obviously, without his consent. And so, look, on the revenge porn stuff, I think that's totally fair game. I'm a, I'm a free speech absolutist, but, you know, revenge porn is one of the things that you file under the category of this just simply isn't free speech. I mean, it's illegal in a lot of states, as it should be. Okay, so now we get to this guy, Michael Schellenberger. He's doing part four of the Twitter files. So he says, the removal of Donald Trump, January 7th. Now, let's just take note of the date that they're really discussing. Hey, maybe it's time. The day after January 6th, where he, you know, prodded a group of his supporters to basically riot at the Capitol. As the, excuse me, as the pressure builds, Twitter executives build the case for a permanent ban. On January 7th, senior Twitter executives create justifications to ban Trump, seek a change of policy for Trump alone, distinct from other political leaders, express no concern for the free speech or democracy implications of a ban. This Twitter files is reported with L. Woodhouse. For those catching up, please see this. Then he goes through part one, part two, uh, part three. And by the way, part three, I don't know if we covered part three. I think we covered part one and two. But part three was just uh, documents that show how senior Twitter executives censored tweets by Trump in the run up to the 2020 election. Um, and they say they coordinated with uh, law enforcement agencies in the process of that. Now, we learned from The Intercept that there was basically a direct line between uh, the FBI, law enforcement agencies, and Twitter. In fact, they had a backdoor portal. I think it was with Facebook where they can reach out directly to say, hey, you might want to take a look at this thing. Uh, that was great reporting from a from, uh, friend of the show, Ken Klippenstein. And so we had already reported on that. That connection I find concerning. I don't think the federal government should be involved in any way, shape, or form with helping to 
you know, filter social media. That's just not their job. And again, you have First Amendment concerns. But the the most of the tweets that they were like, hey, this might violate policy leading up to January 6th were Trump flat out lying about the election being stolen when it wasn't. They had presented no evidence. There were over 60 court cases and they lost almost every single one of them. Um, and they were really sowing discontent and and helping fuel the conspiracy theories. Now, look, again, I think I don't think that's something that on its own can or should be banned. But I also can acknowledge the deleterious effect that that has on the country, that this is like this is not a good thing. It's not a good thing that Trump did that. In fact, it's a very condemnable thing. It's a terrible thing. And it helped lead to something like January 6th. But at the same time, I don't know if that's something that we can fairly say we'll ban that in the same way, you know, they had banned QAnon. I don't think that's okay, even though QAnon is dangerous and stupid and dumb and there's zero evidence for it. I don't think you should be able to ban the 9-11 uh, truth or conspiracy. I don't think you should be able to ban the JFK conspiracy. Because eventually you get to a point where everybody agrees, actually, that was a true conspiracy. Whatever it is. COINTELPRO, Operation Northwoods, whatever. You fill in the blank. So let's continue. For years, Twitter had resisted calls to ban Trump. Quote, blocking a world leader from Twitter it wrote in 2018, would hide important info and hamper necessary discussion around their words and actions. But after the events of January 6th, the internal and external pressure on Twitter CEO Jack grows. Former First Lady Michelle Obama, tech journalist Kara Swisher, the ADL, high-tech VC Chris Saka, and many others publicly call on Twitter to permanently ban Trump. Dorsey was on vacation in French Polynesia the week of January 4th to 8th, 2021. He phoned into meetings, but also delegated much of the handling of the situation to senior execs. Uh, Yo Yoel, Yoel, so this guy Yoel Roth, he's been, he's one of the lead characters, as you'll see. Twitter's global head of trust and safety and Vijaya, head of legal policy and trust. As context, it's important to understand that Twitter staff and senior executives were overwhelmingly progressive. And then they, you know, he goes through the list, uh, basically the percentage of their political donations and where they went. It's not a surprise to me that, uh, you know, social media companies are relatively progressive in the field of tech in general. They tend to lean left in the same way that, you know, teachers lean right in the same way that perhaps in, in the construction business, they lean right or whatever it might be. Sometimes these things just uh, organically develop over the years. In 2017, Roth tweeted that there were actual Nazis in the White House. In April 2022, Roth told a colleague that his goal is to drive change in the world, which is why he decided not to become an academic. On January 7th, Jack emails uh, emails employees saying Twitter needs to remain consistent in its policies, including the right of users to return to Twitter after a temporary suspension, after Roth reassures an employee that, quote, people who care about this aren't happy with where we are. So again, one of the one of the themes that you're going to see here, and you've seen this in the other Twitter files as well, is that Jack was kind of an absentee owner. Like Jack, uh, in my opinion, Jack's uh, default assumptions and his intuitions about the way Twitter should be run, he's he's correct about it. I think he leans much more on the pro free speech side, basically allow anything unless it's not illegal, as long as it doesn't cross a very clear line. But basically, with him not being there and kind of not caring. And uh, the other team members at Twitter not agreeing with that, that sort of led to all this stuff coming to a head at certain times. Around 11.30 a.m. Pacific time, Roth DMs his colleagues with news that he is excited to share. Quote, guess what, he writes, Jack just approved repeat offender for civic, integ for civic integrity. The new approach would create a system where five violations or strikes would result in permanent suspension. So this is something he was working on, Jack. Hey, can we please do this thing? Almost like, you know how they have like the three strikes law. Um, I think it's in California, but it may have been in some other states where three felonies, no matter how bad the felonies are or not bad they are, you know, how, how weak they are, you can go to prison for life after that. Quote, progress, exclaims a member of Roth's trust and safety team. The exchange between Roth and his colleagues makes clear that they had been pushing Jack for greater restrictions on the speech Twitter allows around elections. The colleagues... Uh, Want to know if the decision means Trump can finally be banned, the person asked. Quote, does the incitement to violence aspect change that calculus? Roth says it doesn't. Quote, Trump continues to just have his one strike. Okay. Roth's colleague's query about incitement to violence heavily foreshadows what will happen the following day. On January 8th, Twitter announces a permanent ban on Trump due to the risk of further incitement of violence. The risk of further incitement of violence. On January 8th, Twitter says its ban is based on specifically how Trump's tweets are being received and interpreted. But in 2019, Twitter said it did not attempt to determine 
all potential interpretations of the content or its intent. The only serious concern we found expressed within Twitter over the implications for free speech and democracy of banning Trump came from a junior person in the organization. It was tucked away in a lower-level Slack channel known as Site Integrity Auto. Quote, This might be an unpopular opinion, but, but one-off ad hoc decisions like this that don't appear to be rooted in policy are, in my humble opinion, a slippery slope. This now appears to be a fiat by an online platform CEO with a global presence that can gatekeep speech for the entire world. Twitter employees use the term one-off frequently in their Slack discussions. Its, frequently, its frequent use reveals significant employee discretion over when and whether to apply warning labels on tweets and strikes on users. Recall from Twitter Files 2 by Barry Weiss that according to Twitter staff, quote, we control visibility quite a bit. That's when we learn shadow banning is indeed real. And we continue the amplification of your content quite a bit. And we can control or we control the amplification of your content quite a bit. And normal people do not know how much we do. Twitter employees reorganize, or excuse me, recognize the difference between their own politics and Twitter's terms of service, but they also engage in complex interpretations of content in order to stamp out prohibited tweets as a series of exchanges over the Stop the Steal hashtag reveal. Roth immediately DMs a colleague to ask that they add Stop the Steal and QAnon conspiracy term Kraken to a blacklist of terms to be deamplified. Roth's colleague objects that blacklisting Stop the Steal risks, quote, deamplifying counterspeech that validates the election. So in other words, what they're saying there is you can't just do a blanket ban on QAnon stuff or the term Kraken because there's going to be many people who are tweeting about the quote unquote Kraken that are making fun of the people who believe in the Kraken making fun of the people who've drunk the Kool-Aid on QAnon. And so again, what you're going to notice here is this guy, Yoel Roth, he was definitely the most ban-happy. Definitely the one who wanted Twitter to be the most active in getting involved in what people say. Indeed, notes Roth's colleague, a quick search of the top Stop the Steal tweets and their counter speech. But they quickly come up with a solution. Deamplify accounts with Stop the Steal in the name slash profile since, quote, those are not affiliated with counter speech. So, look, the, uh, my opinion on this, there's two things you need to keep in your mind at the same time. On the one hand, the people who were pushing Stop the Steal, the people who were all in on the election conspiracy theories, they are genuinely toxic and poisonous to the body politic because... They're pushing a narrative that's factually incorrect, it's totally bogus, and also, fundamentally, it wound up being dangerous. Because a lot of people who believed in that theory then took action on it, and it culminated with a riot at the Capitol. And so I understand everybody's, like, hesitance uh, about, what are we going to do, just sit back and let these people, like, go insane and then try to overthrow our country? So I get that people are like really turned off by this and want to take an active role in trying to curtail it. Um, but at the same time, I just don't agree as a matter of principle with the the action taken by Twitter and the action taken by a number of social media companies because it is the slippery, slippery slope of all time. It really is. Because, you know, the original idea of Twitter was like, hey, say whatever you want as long as you're not basically breaking the law and it, it's fine. And once you start, again, going down this path, okay, where does it end? So, imagine we had Twitter in during the 2000 election, and the people who were labeled conspiracy theorists were the ones who said Al Gore won, but it actually turned out to be factually correct that Al Gore won. A consortium of different news outlets got together after the election and did a recount of the ballots in Florida, and they countered it every which way possible with dimpled chads, with hanging chads, etc., and they realized that Al Gore got the most, most votes no matter how you did the recount. And remember, the Supreme Court had stepped in to say, stop the recount. We're not allowing them to do a recount in Florida. And so you would have been correct, right? If you questioned how Hillary Clinton effectively tried to steal the, the 2016 election from Bernie Sanders, she was working with the news outlets who were helping her. They were, you know, Debbie Wasserman Schultz. The head of the DNC was doing everything she could to give Hillary an advantage and put their finger on the scale, uh, on the thumb on the scale for uh, to defeat Bernie. And if you point that out, and we learned a lot from WikiLeaks, too, about how that's accurate. That wasn't just a suspicion of Bernie supporters. So if you say those things, they could ban you for that. Right. So and then also 
Russiagate, for example, was total bullshit, but the dominant narrative was pro-Russiagate, and the people who were criticizing Russiagate, even though they were correct, they would have been the ones who were banned as conspiracy theorists. So in other words, there is no... The point I'm trying to make is you can't have these, like, philosopher kings who are overlords who get to determine this stuff. Now, in this instance, the so-called philosopher kings happen to be correct that Stop the Steal is terrible and wrong and bad and, and led to terrible consequences, etc. But still, you need to be able to condemn Stop the Steal, debunk Stop the Steal, explain why it's wrong, while also saying, you know, you're allowed to, to say things, right? You can say things publicly. As long as it's not a direct threat of violence, or libel, or slander, or doxing, or impersonation, or, the, you know, the few things that are against the law and what should be the terms of service. Anyway, all right, let's continue. Employees struggle with whether to punish users who share screenshots of Trump's deleted January 6th tweets. Quote, we should bounce these tweets with a strike, uh, given the screenshot violates the policy. They are criticizing Trump, so I'm a bit hesitant with applying strikes to this user. So, um, so the tweet that they're talking about here, Trump says, These are the things and events that happen when a sacred landslide election victory is so unceremoniously and viciously stripped away from great patriots who have been badly and unfairly treated for so long. Go home with love and in peace. Remember this day forever. And then this person replied, Fuck off. Oh my God. Even Twitter says it's inciting violence. Okay. And so they were talking about, you know, they, they had already banned Trump, but now they're saying maybe... Any screenshot shared of Trump, even if it's to criticize him, maybe we should get rid of that. So it's almost like you can see the slippery slope in real time. And honestly, I think this part of the conversation is fucking psychopathic. I mean, this is crazy. It's one thing, I, I grant you that there is a debate to be had on January 6th as to whether or not Trump incited violence. He also spoke out of both sides of his mouth, right? Like, he, you know, when it became clear this thing wasn't going to work and it was violent and it was bad... He did say, go home. He went out and gave the speech and said, go home. He, of course, also sucked them off in that speech. But he spoke out of both sides of his mouth to give himself enough plausible deniability that perhaps he wasn't inciting violence, right? Um, so I understand the debate about, hey, did Trump violate the terms of service? But to say people who are critiquing him and showing his screenshots, I mean, come on, this is insane. This is insane. What if a user dislikes Trump and objects to Twitter censorship? Boom. That's me right there. The tweet still gets deleted. But since the intention is not to deny the election result, no punishing strike is applied. See how arbitrary all this is? If there are instances where the intent is unclear, please feel free to raise. Around noon, a confused senior executive in advertising sales sends a DM to Roth. Sales exec. Jack says, we will permanently suspend Trump if our policies are violated after 12-hour account lock. What policies is Jack talking about? Roth. Any policy violation. What happens next is essential to understanding how Twitter justified banning Trump. Sales executive. Are we dropping the public interest policy now? Roth, six hours later. In this specific case, we're changing our public interest approach for his account. So in other words, they're carving out specific, specific rules for just him, because they're just, they're, Roth is working backwards from his conclusion that I want him gone. Now again, I get it, right? Like, I understand why he's pissed, why he's angry, why he wants to get rid of him. The guy did speak out of both sides of his mouth, but effectively incite a riot and a, a pathetic attempt to overthrow the government. So I get it. I understand it. But the reason why they're like, well, we have to make a specific exception here is because, number one, it wasn't truly clear if he should be banned. And number two, you have, like, Taliban officials who are leaders on Twitter. Or Taliban leaders who are official on Twitter, I should say. So, you know, you got people who literally just stormed and <laughs> stormed into, um, you know, the Afghanistan government took it over. And it's like, they're still on. You have uh, the leader of Iran is still on. Like, you, it's hard to have a consistent standard when you don't have a consistent standard if you, like, allow them on, but you don't allow Trump on. So they're trying to find a way to do it. This ad exec is referring to Twitter's policy of public interest exceptions, which allow the content of ele of elected officials, even if it violates Twitter rules, if it directly contributes to understanding or discussion of a matter of public concern. Roth pushes for a permanent suspension of Representative Matt Gates, even though it doesn't quite fit anywhere. It's a kind of test case for the rationale behind banning Trump. Quote, I'm trying to talk Twitter's safety team into removal as a conspiracy that incites violence. So again, this guy, Yoel Roth, he's the one who's, he's just trying by any means necessary to get rid of these people and barely doing sort of a terms of service uh, ad hoc justification. 
Around 2.30, comms execs DM Roth to say they don't want to make a big deal of the QAnon ban to the media because they fear, quote, if we push this, it looks like we're trying to offer up something in place of the thing everyone wants, meaning a Trump ban. So anyway, there, there you have it. Um, I, to tell you guys the truth, I don't know how much of this is a quote-unquote bombshell because this is like, we knew what happened behind the scenes in, in the sense that they had a debate, they ended up banning Trump. Um, so we knew that what's happening now is we're just getting the specifics filled in. And basically the gist of it insofar as I could tell is that most people were sort of, they didn't know what to do or they were agnostic. Um, and this guy, Yoel Roth, sort of, he was the leader. He was the one who, um, took charge. There were other, other, uh, issues where it was Vijaya Gotti who did that. So they seem to be the two most ban happy, the two who want Twitter to be involved the most in censoring, deplatforming, shadow banning, filtering, etc. Um, and so that's what it is. That's what it is. So now, now you all know Trump is back on Twitter. Um, Elon Musk said he was going to have bring in a committee to determine whether or not it's right to bring him back, and then he went back on that and just did a Twitter poll, and Trump coming back barely won, and so he went with, okay, fine, I'll put Trump back on Twitter. But Trump is not using Twitter because he's got Truth Social now, and he has a lot of money tied up in that. So, anyway, this, this is the background of it. Again, I don't know how much we learned in this particular one, because we knew he was banned, we knew there was probably a debate behind the scenes, but now we just know the specific players. And again, the people who sort of led the charge were this guy, Yoel Roth and uh, Vijay Gotti in other contexts. Um, Jack was just a total absentee owner who I think disagreed with all this stuff, but didn't care enough to, to fight for it. And so, there you have it. Now, I'll give you a couple more things before we wrap this segment up. New. Elon Musk is threatening to sue Twitter employees who leak confidential information to the press. Huh? He's asking staffers to sign a pledge, indicating they've understood. And then this guy, uh, this guy links the email underneath here. So... This is massively ironic because, of course, um, you know, you have Elon Musk who's sort of making a big show about you being pro-transparency. And then at the same time now, he's apparently doing the exact opposite with the company as it exists today. So he's fine leaking the dirt on the previous Twitter owners. But now that he's in charge, he's being very aggressive in keeping everything that's happening now under wraps. Uh, this, I mean, this is classic Elon hypocrisy, right? We saw this with shadow banning, too. One of the Twitter files, uh, you know, described how they do shadow banning. That's a real thing. And then everybody's like, oh, my God, bombshell. This is crazy. You believe this? But then Elon has a tweet from the other day that's like, uh, freedom of speech does not mean freedom of reach. So we're going to boost the positive content and de-boost the negative content. That's shadow banning. <laughs> that's shadow banning. So it's kind of funny that on apparently, seemingly on every issue, Elon has been a massive hypocrite. Um, in fact, there's a thread here that goes through everything that's happened since he bought Twitter. Elon Musk's inconsistency is a thread. Elon's created an outrage cycle about how Twitter limited the reach of certain accounts while also having said freedom of speech, not freedom of reach, was his own principle. Elon has accused the previous team of ignoring CSAM while firing wide swaths of the CSAM team. So this is the team that tracks child sexual abuse. He was going after the previous Twitter people for, oh, you guys didn't take this seriously. Meanwhile, there was an article, and uh, I think we talked about this on the show, or at the very least, I, I tweeted about it. There was an article in the Los Angeles Times, Job Cuts by Elon Musk Decimated Twitter Team Tackling Child Sexual Abuse. So they were running with, um, they were running with what's called a skeleton crew. So as he's attacking the previous owners for a thing... He is currently doing that thing. Elon threatens leakers with lawsuits while posting about how he's a free speech absolutist and selectively leaking tons of files himself. Elon declared sunlight is the best disinfectant, but refused to release internal files to major news outlets. Only the hand-picked columnists, even when Jack specifically requested his email archives be published. Elon says hate speech will be de-boosted but not banned, but then bans Kanye West for his swastika post, which was, which was awful but was very much not illegal or inciting violence. That's true. Elon promises no unbans will happen, 
without co convening a content moderation council, then later decides whether or not to unban Donald Trump by Twitter poll. Elon admits that the poll is filled with bots and trolls, but then refers to the poll results as the voice of the people. <laughs> Elon says comedy is legal, but then goes on a spree of banning comedic parody accounts only a week later. I remember that one, because a lot of those accounts were making fun of Elon himself. And of course, Elon couldn't even be consistent about whether he wanted to buy Twitter in the first place. He did, then he didn't, then he did. I'm sure I missed some, but these, are, but these illustrate the point. The only principles I can see that Elon has reliably stuck to are disparage the previous owners and team at every opportunity, tilt the cultural outrage cycles in the direction of the very online right. Anyway, there you have it. So this guy, Jeremiah Johnson, with a really interesting thread. Um, apparently he has a podcast here that he's hawking. Anyway, there you have it. Um, what went on behind the scenes at Twitter in detail in regards to the banning of Donald Trump. Hey, y'all, do me a favor and like and subscribe. It helps out big time in the algorithm. Click the bell as well for notifications when videos drop. And watch that video on screen right now. You know you want to.